Simon & Schuster Audio Works presents Enterprise, The First Adventure by Vonda N. McIntyre. This program is read by George Takei, with Leonard Nimoy as the voice of Spock. Blood flows in strange patterns in zero gravity. Jim struggled forward, fighting to see, fighting to stay conscious, fighting to move through the pain of his crushed knees and his broken ribs, fighting to breathe against the blood in his lungs. The two ships had crashed together. He bolted awake, gasping, and dragged himself from the nightmare. He had lived through his ship's destruction once in reality, and a hundred times in sleep. James T. Kirk, the newest captain in Starfleet, the hero of Axanar and Gilg, flung aside the memories. Today was a day not for nightmares, but for dreams. Today, he would become the new commander of the Starship Enterprise. Science Officer's Log, star date 0000.5. Today is the final day of Captain Christopher Pike's 15-year command of the Starship Enterprise, and the first day of the command of Captain James T. Kirk. Captain, now Commodore Pike, is a mature officer of enormous experience. Captain Kirk is the youngest human ever promoted to Starfleet captain. His only previous command was the late space cruiser Lydia Sutherland. During the unfortunate altercation at Geogi, Captain Kirk saved many lives at the risk of his own and at the cost of his ship. The record indicates that Captain Kirk received severe injuries and that he has recovered from them. The record further indicates that he has been both commended for his bravery and reprimanded for his audacity. Common sense indicates that the personnel of the Enterprise should prepare themselves for change. A keen, cold night wind ruffled powdery dust against Coronin's boots. It caught the renegade's long copper hair and blew it back from her brow ridges. She halted at a sleek new ship, the secret pride of the Klingon military. Her key and the ship exchanged complex electronic communication. The hatch opened. She stepped inside. My lord, the ship's sergeant stopped in confusion. My lady, if you permit, I will take you to the command balcony to wait for my lord. Your lord will not be returning, Corodin said. It amused her to be taken for the previous commander's newest mistress. Your lord has given up his ship and his life. The sergeant stared at her, stunned. Coronin knew he would attack her before he knew it himself. She placed the point of her blade at his throat. I am Coronin, she said. This ship is mine. You may swear yourself to me, or you may die. He hesitated, and then he did the honorable thing. I swear myself to your service, Coronin, he said. Satisfied, she lowered her blade. Prepare for liftoff. What destination, Coronin? The Federation border, she said. She would like to see what mischief she could make for Federation and Empire alike. Following Commodore Christopher Pike, Jim Kirk stepped on board the Enterprise for the first time. All he really wanted to do was explore, but good manners required him to attend the reception the ship's officers had prepared. Pike led the way to the recreation deck. When he entered, low chatter faded to silence. Officers of the Enterprise, Pike said. My friends, this is James Kirk, your new captain. I trust you will give him the same support and loyalty that you've given me. Jim felt uncomfortably on display as Pike shook his hand and the other officers applauded politely. Captain, Pike said, the ship is yours. 
The reception began to relax into a party. Chris Pike gave Jim a glass of champagne. Congratulations, Jim, he said. Come along, I'll introduce you. Jim looked around for Admiral Noguchi, hoping to get his new orders. The Federation poised on the edge of an unprecedented exploration of space. Jim wanted to lead that exploration. He wanted the mission so badly he could reach out and feel its shape with his empty hands. But Noguchi was nowhere in sight. As Pike led Jim toward a group of four officers, the party suddenly fell into one of those odd random silences. A vehement Scots burr cut into the quiet. I cannot understand Starfleet handing over its best ship to an inexperienced Tyro. He heard his own voice. He stopped. Pike cleared his throat. Jim pretended he had not heard the tactless remark. Captain Kirk, Pike said. Commander Spock, Chief Engineer Montgomery Scott, Communications Lieutenant Uhura, and Sulu, sir, said the youngest member of the group. Jim acknowledged them. The tall, ascetically spare Vulcan wore a formal uniform and the insignia of the science section. So... This is my second-in-command, Jim thought. I wonder if he'll live up to his reputation. Jim Kirk had little use for science officers. They always wanted to impart more information than he needed at any given moment about any given problem. With any luck, this science officer would be one of those withdrawn intellectual types who preferred to remain secluded in the depths of the ship's laboratories. Commander Spock, Jim said. Captain Kirk. Spock took James Kirk's measure with a glance. The science officer had made it his business to learn about Captain Kirk. Starfleet was handing over the Enterprise to a hero. Commander Spock had little use for heroes. Whatever the self-sacrifice required for heroism, however commendable or admirable the heroic actions, a person could become a hero only within an environment of chaos and destruction. In Spock's view, foresight and rationality should prevent the evolution of any such environment. Jim turned to the chief engineer and spoke in a tone he hoped was civil. Mr. Scott. You have the finest ship in Starfleet to live up to, Captain. I'm sure I do, Mr. Scott. Captain Kirk, Lieutenant Uhura's voice was low and musical, intense and intelligent. Jim forgot his uneasiness, Scott's belligerence, Spock's unreadable expression. After a moment, he realized he was gaping at Uhura like a witless schoolboy. Uh, yes, Lieutenant Uhura. Glad to make your acquaintance. The three veteran officers had spent years working out the formula by which they interacted. James Kirk, a new unknown, watched them wonder if he could center himself within their orbits. Or if, like a rogue star, he would enter their system on a hyperbolic course and leave chaos behind him. Only time would answer their question, and his own. Jim turned toward the other newcomer, his own choice for helm officer. Lieutenant Sulu, fresh out of the academy and with a brand new commission, had been on the Enterprise only a couple of hours longer than Jim. Mr. Sulu, Jim said. How did the fencing tournament go? Um, I won the all-around, Captain Sulu said, and clearly surprised that Jim even knew about it. Pike took Jim off to meet the rest of the officers of the Enterprise. Soon the names and faces blurred together. In one moment of complete clarity, Lieutenant Uhura was persuaded to sing. Jim listened, transfixed by her voice. When her song ended, and it did not appear that she would sing another, Jim decided... He had fulfilled his obligation to good manners. He had definitely waited long enough for Admiral Noguchi. He slept away from the party to explore his ship. The Enterprise was incredible. Jim wandered through its corridors from the highest deck to the lowest, marveling that this creation was under his command. Near the shuttlecraft deck, Jim smelled drying hay. He had grown up on a farm in Iowa. He knew what hay smelled like, and he knew it smelled like nothing that ought to be on a starship. He frowned. In space, 
anything strange or unknown could mean danger. Jim hurried to the catwalk above the dim shuttlecraft deck. Lights, he said. The deck lights brightened. An iridescent creature snorted and bolted to its feet, spraddle-legged and challenging, head up, ears pricked, nostrils flared. The horse spread its great black wings. What are you doing? A small black-clad figure ran across the catwalk. Her iridescent black hair streamed behind her. Jim barred her way. What's that thing doing on my shuttlecraft deck? She's not a thing. She's an equiraptor. And Admiral Noguchi said nobody would bother her. Admiral Noguchi? At that moment, the Admiral himself strode onto the catwalk. Jim, he said, what are you doing here? Hello, Ms. Lucarian. You two have met, I see. Jim, I was hoping to surprise you, but never mind. We can make the announcement together. Sir, Jim said, that creature is obstructing my shuttlecraft deck. It's all right, Jim. You won't need shuttlecraft on this mission. What exactly, Jim said, suspecting that he no longer wanted to know, is the mission. Admiral Noguchi handed Jim his orders. After Jim read them, he stared at Noguchi in shock. Sir, I had hoped for a challenging assignment. Improving the morale at our star base is challenging, Jim, and important. Besides, after Georg, you need time to recover from your injuries. I'm perfectly healthy now. Admiral, you can't mean Starfleet has assigned the Enterprise to ferry around a... A bunch of entertainers. I mean that I have given you this task. I have also given you command of this ship. Neither order is carved in stone. Is that understood? Any further questions, Captain Kirk? Jim hesitated for perhaps a second, almost a second too long. No, sir, he said. Good. Jim and Amelinda Lucarian regarded each other warily until Admiral Noguchi left the catwalk. This isn't quite what you expected, is it? Lucarian said gently. That's an understatement. We'll both have to make the best of it, she said. If Jim had lost the mission he really wanted, it was not Lucarian's fault. Yes, we will, Jim offered his hand. I'm... I'm Elinda Lucarian, she said. Her hand was warm and strong. My friends call me Lindy. James Kirk. My friends call me Jim. When the director of the Oversight Committee of the Klingon Empire tried to contact the commander of the newest fighter ship in the fleet, he received no reply. He increased the intensity of his contact attempts, but the ship, a prototype, was nowhere to be found. The director had worked long and hard to get that particular ship for that particular officer. He diverted all his operatives to search for the new ship, the ship commanded by his son. Science Officer's Log, Stardate 001.3. Captain Kirk delayed the departure of the Enterprise for several hours while surreptitiously attempting to locate the ship's new chief medical officer, Dr. Leonard McCoy. When Dr. McCoy finally did appear, he arrived on the bridge in a most disreputable state. He was out of uniform, dressed in rags, one might say, without exaggeration. He was unkempt and unshaven, and he sported a seriously bruised and apparently untreated scrape on one leg. One must hope that he takes better care of his patients than he does of himself. Leonard McCoy let Jim Kirk hustle him off the bridge, into the turbo lift, and away from the curious stares of their new shipmates. Bones, what happened to you? Jim said angrily as soon as the lift doors closed. I almost had to put you on report. I almost had to have you replaced. 
I was on vacation, at your insistence, as I recall. I went to the Grand Canyon. His enthusiasm spilled over. White water rafting. Have you ever tried it? No. It's magnificent. We traipse off to the far corners of the universe, but there are incredible places on our own world that we haven't even seen. You should have called me. I wouldn't have had to give so many evasive answers about where you were. The canyon's a historical preservation area. Calm units aren't allowed. McCoy looked Jim up and down. But enough about me. How are you feeling? I'm all right. What about the nightmares? I can handle the nightmares. I'm glad to hear it, McCoy said mildly, knowing when not to push. Jim Kirk could be exasperating. McCoy remembered back a few years. When Jim was a lieutenant, he had been brash and arrogant and impatient, even with superior officers. As a lieutenant, Jim Kirk had been like a colt, held under too tight a rein. His promotion to the commander of the Lydia Sutherland both gentled and strengthened him. The responsibility of leadership tempered his arrogance and his impatience. But McCoy was concerned about the effect on Jim of losing his first ship. It had been a deep, hard blow. If Jim ever chose to talk about it, McCoy would be there to listen. Leaving McCoy to change into uniform, Jim returned to the bridge and took his seat. Release all moorings. Mr. Sulu, take her out. The Enterprise left space dock on impulse engines. Jim felt the power of the ship waiting for his command. Warp factor one, Mr. Sulu. Warp factor one, sir. The Enterprise sped majestically toward the stars. Jim had never felt such power in a ship. It seemed to flow into him. It seemed to enhance his senses. Warp factor two. Effortlessly, the Enterprise accelerated. Giving a physical exam to someone with the control of biological processes that Vulcans possessed was a mere exercise. The fact that Dr. McCoy was not quite ready for him simply added to the waste of Spock's time. Dr. McCoy finally strolled into Spock's cubicle. Commander Spock, welcome to sick bay. Right on time. I was on time, Spock said. However, it is now eleven minutes past on time. He lay on the diagnostic table. The sensors blended into the precise pattern that the Vulcan expected. As you can see, Doctor, my health... Stay right there. Why, Mr. Spock, I don't believe I've ever encountered a set of readings quite like yours. They are all within the range of Vulcan norm. Edging close to humans, some of them, McCoy regarded the censors. Are you quite finished, Doctor? No, not by a long shot. Don't move. I haven't had much chance to practice on Vulcans, or half Vulcans, he grinned. Aren't you interested in contributing to my education? I have obeyed regulations by submitting to this examination. I see no use in remaining while you satisfy trivial inquisitiveness. Why, Mr. Spock, I do believe you're angry. No, Doctor, I am not angry, but I see no point to wasting my time. All right, Mr. Spock, if that's the way you feel about it. That is what I think about it. There is a difference, though you choose not to perceive it. He left sickbay without another word. After Commander Spock left for his physical, Lindy Lucarian appeared on the bridge. Hi, Jim. We came to take you up on the offer of a tour. A tide of pastel pudding snapped at Jim's boots. One buried its teeth in his blouse right pants leg. Let go. Go on now. Oh, damn. Jim snatched his hand away. Evie, Toto, Mimi, come. Sit. Stay. Lindy's companion picked up the offending animal. Evie, evil puppy, you know you mustn't bite. Don't worry, Captain. She's just excited. Jim, 
Lindy said. Uh, this is my friend, Newland Yanagimachi Rift. He runs the animal lag. Rift was two meters tall and about half that wide. He wore the complex hairstyle of a traditional sumo wrestler. Though his skin was a warm shade of gold, his hair was red and his eyes were blue. Captain Kirk, Uhura said, subspace transmission for Ms. Lucarian. Jim was grateful for the distraction. Put it on screen, Lieutenant. On the view screen, five blazing torches circled furiously, obscuring the juggler behind them. He caught one, two, three, four, spun the last torch high out of range of the screen and caught it as it tumbled into view. He extinguished the flames. He pulled loose the blue ribbon at the nape of his neck and bowed, shaking his golden hair free. I hear you need a juggler. You're in, Lindy said. Welcome to the Warp Speed Classic Vaudeville Company. I'm Lindy Lucarian. The long, ascetic lines of the juggler's face broke into a brilliant smile. His hair curled below his collar. The blue of his eyes was so pale it was almost gray. His blonde eyebrows slanted upward, very like a Vulcan's. You can call me Stephen. Light glinted from his single ruby earring. Something else caught Jim's attention. Stephen's ears were pointed. He was a Vulcan. Commander Spock stood at the turbo lift entrance, staring at the view screen. His expression was hard, not with imperturbability, but with shock and violently repressed anger. That evening, in the officer's lounge, Jim started toward McCoy's table. When he saw Commander Spock sitting by himself with a three-dimensional chess set, he changed his mind and joined the science officer instead. Need an opponent? No, Captain, Spock said without looking up. Why are you playing alone? Because, Captain, no one on board plays at my level. You're modest, aren't you? Vulcans have evolved beyond character traits such as modesty and immodesty. Jim was more interested in Commander Spock's unvulcan-like reaction to Stephen than he was in 3D chess. Mr. Spock, do you know Lindy's new juggler? Mr. Spock hesitated. Yes, Captain. Tell me about him. There is little to tell. He is a Vulcan. A Vulcan juggler. Juggling is an excellent method of improving hand-eye coordination, Captain Kirk. It takes concentration, patience, and practice. You sound like an expert. I am hardly unique among Vulcans in developing the ability. Maybe we don't need this fellow after all. Why don't you help Lindy out instead? Because she did not ask me, Captain. Jim had the feeling Mr. Spock was trying to distract him from Stephen. What do you know about your Vulcan friend? He is not my friend. He comes from an unobjectionable family. He has used an excellent education and many advantages to little purpose. Jim frowned. I don't understand the problem here, Commander. He deliberately involves himself in emotional experiences. I believe humans would call him a thrill seeker. Jim would have sworn Commander Spock was embarrassed if he had not been told so often that Vulcans had no such reactions. Is that all? Yes, Captain. Good Lord! You acted like you'd seen an axe murderer. Spock considered. The analogy is not unreasonable. He is a pervert. Jim could not help it. He laughed. Commander Spock turned away. He gazed at his chessboard. He moved the Black Queen to threaten the White King. White to checkmate in three, Jim said instantly. 
Spark looked up in disbelief. Smiling to himself, Jim strolled toward McCoy, who sat with several other Enterprise officers and the vaudeville company's neo-Shakespearean actor, Mr. Coxper. Neo-Shakespeareans, Jim had been told, made their own translations of William Shakespeare's plays so that modern audiences could understand them. Jim had never seen a neo-Shakespearean perform. He had seen a few of the plays in the original. He had found them perfectly comprehensible. Ah, Jim, McCoy said. Do join us. Oh, Captain, Mr. Coxper said as Jim sat down. I was just observing that the Enterprise is rather an expensive vehicle to use for the transportation of... <clears throat> Vaudeville. Your ship would be put to better use fighting the enemies of the Federation. Oh no, Jim thought. Another earthbound nincompoop who thinks the purpose of Starfleet is to blow people and planets out of the sky. We aren't at war with anyone, Mr. Coxper. But there are wars to conquer. Mr. Coxper started to lecture Jim on politics. A shadow fell across the table, and Mr. Coxper fell silent. Would the captain oblige me? Spock said, with the answer to a question. Certainly, Mr. Spock. Pardon me, Jim said to Mr. Coxper, concealing his relief. Regarding white checkmate in three, Spock said, I apologize. I should have barged in on your problem. Then, Spock said, white cannot checkmate in three moves. Yes, it can. Did you think I was making a joke? One can never be certain, Spock said, when a human being is making a joke. Usually, we laugh. Not invariably. Uh, no, not invariably. Still, I wasn't making a joke. I'll be glad to play out the problem with you. Jim moved the Queen's Knight. Spock regarded the chessboard. One black eyebrow tilted to a steeper slant. He stared at the positions as if calculating every move of every piece. Jim had seen the opening in a flash of insight. Now he wondered if he had made some schoolchild error. Spock tipped his king and let it settle onto its squat base. I resign, Spock said, with the barest suggestion of confusion. Your move risked your queen and your knights. It was illogical, but effective, Jim said. Indeed. Nevertheless, that's my method of calculation. Spock cleared the board. Would you care, Spock asked, for a complete game? Science Officer's Log, Stardate 0002.2 Last evening's chess game with Captain Kirk proved most interesting. At first, I easily compelled him to play on the defensive. His radical solution to the problem I had set was, I decided, a fortuitous random move. Certainly, his strategy and tactics did not appear particularly far-sighted. On this basis, I gave up my premature assumption that the Enterprise had gained a chess expert as well as a captain. Then, however, Captain Kirk executed a flamboyant, one might even say reckless, series of moves. He took the game. It was a most instructive experience, one worth repeating. Captain Kirk's second day of command is proceeding without incident. It is my hope that this peaceful situation will continue. But as the Enterprise will soon pick up the renegade Vulcan who goes by the name of Stephen, I can only assume that incidents will occur. Around Stephen, incidents are inevitable. Captain Kirk invited me to join him and Ms. Lucarian in greeting the Vaudeville Company's new juggler. I have declined the honor. Jim and Lindy waited at the hatch to meet Stephen. The Vulcan docked his ship, which was called Dionysus, and strolled on board the Enterprise. Thanks for the job, Stephen smiled at Lindy. 
My pleasure, she said. And thanks for your hospitality, Captain. They headed for the bridge. Four or five centimeters taller than Spock, Stephen was built along the same slender lines. Blonde and blue-eyed Vulcans, while uncommon, came within the normal range of types. But Stephen's expression revealed him in a way quite foreign to other Vulcans, and no Vulcan Jim had ever seen permitted his hair to grow as long and shaggy as Stephen's. They reached the bridge. Spock raised his head. This time, he permitted himself no reaction. Stephen strode toward him. Spock rose. His expression hardened. How are you, Spock? I cannot talk with you, Spock said. I have duties to attend to. He turned his back. Mr. Spock, Jim said. Reserve was one thing. Downright rudeness was another. Never mind, Captain. Let's go below, Lindy said, embarrassed for them both. You should meet the rest of the company and Athena. Athena, the winged horse, the equiraptor, spread her iridescent feathered wings. Her black coat shone with highlights of green and purple and gold. She raised her head and pricked her ears. The shuttlecraft deck had been carpeted with dirt and planted with accelerated desert grass to make a temporary pasture for the creature. Over the objection of Mr. Scott, Jim had changed the gravity to one-tenth normal so the equiraptor could try to fly. But there was not quite enough room for her to learn. Lindy grabbed Athena's mane, swung up, and rode across the deck. Mane and tail rippling, wings open, Athena trotted down the deck, hesitating for a split second before she put each hoof to the ground, floating between each step. Lindy laughed, her arms spread wide, her hair flying. Jim watched in trance. She's really something, isn't she? Stephen said. Yes, Jim said. She really is. Because of information brought by his spies, the director of the Klingon Oversight Committee mobilized the fleet of the secret police before the oligarchy noticed that their prototype ship had been lost. The director had not personally commanded a mission in many years. He ascended to the command deck, oblivious to space and stars, intent only on his pursuit of Corvin. The renegade could expose his son's unworthiness to the world. The course he ordered sent his fleet toward the Federation border, toward Starbase 13. Science Officer's Log, Stardate 0004.7. Captain Kirk has arranged a performance of Ms. Lucarian's company for the crew of the Enterprise. Though I am, of course, uninterested in entertainment, I am curious about Ms. Lucarian. In conversation, I found her intelligent. I judged her to be both rational and ethical. It is possible, however, that I have misjudged her. She claims to be a magician. Magic is often used by humans to defraud gullible individuals and to engender a belief in the supernatural. In order to determine her true character, I must observe her practicing her profession. I mentioned my concerns to Captain Kirk but he stated with apparent asperity that Ms. Lucarian planned an entertainment, not a conspiracy. He asked if I expected Lucarian to set up a seance or to help me, for a suitable fee, contact my dead great-aunt Matilda. I wondered how he knew that my mother's deceased aunt was named Matilda. The captain replied that he guessed he was psychic. A blue spotlight flashed on center stage. A Melinda Lucarian gazed out, silent and aloof. She had simply appeared, as if by magic. She plucked a glittering object from the air. She held up the sapphire, and it disappeared. She reached up and plucked another jewel from nothingness. It is, of course, Spock said, the same jewel. The second sapphire, like the first, vanished. The jewel is still in her hand, Spock said. Shut up, Commander, Captain Cook whispered. That's a direct, 
House lights! And Melinda stood at the edge of the stage, glaring down. The house lights brightened. Commander Spock, and Melinda said with perfect composure, would you care to repeat your comments so the audience can hear you? A jewel is still in your hand. She held out her open hand. The jewel is not in my hand. Your other hand. The jewel isn't in my hand or in my hand. And Melinda extended her other hand, open and empty. Spock raised one eyebrow. And Melinda regarded Spock with a smile, accepting him as a worthy opponent. I usually ask for volunteers later on, but since you're so eager, Commander Spock, you can help me now. Spock rose from his seat and sprang onto the stage. The spotlight fell upon a glass box formed of open-work filigree. An empty box, and Melinda waved her wand beneath it, inside it. It stands high above the floor. It has no hidden escapes, no electronics. Mr. Spock, if you would enter the box. Why would I wish to do this? Because, as before, I have nothing up my sleeves. Spock climbed inside. Light reflecting from the box obscured all but the vague outline of his body. Now I'll secure him. A Melinda thrust the rapier through an opening in the filigree. Silence, please, a Melinda said. You mustn't disturb my concentration. It could be dangerous. The magician thrust a dozen swords through the science officer's shadowy shape. And Melinda withdrew the swords. She flung open the door. The light steadied. In the audience, Jim blinked, dazzled. A figure stood inside the box. And Melinda took his hand. Leonard McCoy stepped from the magic box. And Melinda Lucarian and Dr. McCoy both bowed. The lights faded and they were gone. The secret exit from the magic box led Spock into a briefing room adjacent to the theater. He would never have deduced the method of escape from the box, but having experienced it, he admired its simplicity. And Melinda strode in. What do you mean by heckling my performance? Heckling? I merely pointed out. Merely? Merely? Why didn't you explain everything I did? Then everybody could say, but that's so easy. But it isn't easy. Mr. Spock, how could you do that to me? I thought you liked me. I do not like anyone. It is not in my nature to like or dislike. You implied that the jewel disappeared by supernatural means. I felt it my duty to point out that no such thing had happened. Magicians have been known to perpetrate frauds. Mr. Spock, if I were working a scam, would I admit I was a stage magician? That is a telling point. I have not considered it. You could have spoiled the show for your shipmates, never mind for me. Didn't you understand that? No, I did not. Vulcans and children. Never perform for Vulcans or children. That was my daddy's advice. Spock hurried to his station through fluctuating gravity fields. Reports streamed in from all sections. In the captain's seat, Jim Kirk peered intently at the view screen. Something ripped us out of warp speed, Mr. Sulu exclaimed. Warp drive severely damaged, Captain, Spock said. Subspace communication is impossible. Then from nowhere, a powerful signal appeared. An eerie peace possessed the ship. Captain, Spock said. Anomaly, dead ahead. Spock tried to match this reading to a planetary or stellar or interstellar or quasi-stellar object. He failed. An enormous curved surface filled the view screen, hurtling closer. The iridescent surface resolved itself into a cluster of mammoth pearls. A webbing of silvery strands connected them. Jim Kirk watched the screen, amazed at the object's enormity. 
Finally, its limits came into view. It glowed. A luminescent skeleton supported the soap bubble skin. Streams of light formed a pool above it. It looks alive, McCoy said. Captain, Spock said. The Enterprise is within communication range of the Federation. Regulations require informing Starfleet of this incident. That would mean giving up the chance of making a first contact, Jim thought. I'd have to turn, run, wait till we repaired subspace communications, and have my superiors send another ship with a more experienced captain to take over my job. Everybody looked peaceful, Jim said. Hailing frequencies, Lieutenant. Hailing frequencies open, sir. This is James T. Kirk, captain of the Starship Enterprise. I represent the Federation of Planets, an interstellar alliance dedicated to peace, to knowledge, to friendship among all sentient beings. Greetings and welcome. Sir, I'm getting a transmission. This was it. A first contact. An image formed. Jim whistled softly. My mother's magnolias, McCoy whispered. The being possessed a humanoid shape of delicate proportions, covered with smooth scarlet fur. Huge luminous eyes glowed in its dark face. A structure like a mustache surrounded the nostrils and bracketed the mouth. The being extended its tongue and delicately brushed a tip across the surface. Jim offered his hand, palm up, to the being. I am James Kirk. Welcome to the Federation of Planets. The being did the same thing. Then it sang. Remarkable, Spock said. Jim remembered Lieutenant Uhura singing at the party. Lieutenant Uhura, he said, would you consent to sing at something? Mesmerized by the voice, she began to sing. Her lullaby held peace and beauty, endless rivers, ageless mountains. The scarlet being's large, pointed ears raised up from the sides of its head. The bristly tufts at their tips stiffened. Uhura's final note faded to silence. Thank you, Lieutenant. Kirk wanted to say more. He wanted to say, that was extraordinarily beautiful. A new image radiated onto the view screen. Streaks of light sketched the alien construct. A tiny spot of light, a glass miniature of the Enterprise, hovered in the foreground. It moved toward the structure, sailing over it, into it and among the glowing lines it vanished I think we've been invited for a visit Jim said Jim chose not to risk the enterprise in the atmosphere of the alien construct instead he beamed down with commander Spock they materialized near a group of the new beings Jim picked out the scarlet one a sensory structure above its mouth riffled. The being approached, taller than Jim, taller than Spock. It had fine, narrow bones. Its chest was deep from front to back. Its small feet possessed claws, even more impressive than those on its hands. Along its sleek, streamlined body grew a narrow frill that extended to the backs of its arms and the edges of its hands, and down the sides of its legs and feet. The being sang a few notes. Jim's translator produced gibberish in response. Welcome to the Federation of Planets, Jim said. Thank you for welcoming us to your ship. The scarlet being stepped forward. Jim extended his hands. The two species touched for the first time. Science Officer's Log, Stardate 0006.1.
Captain Kirk and I collected an enormous amount of data. Though we could not communicate with the new beings directly, our interaction was most fascinating. The captain concentrated his attention upon the scarlet being. However, I could detect no individual who took a leader's part. In strangeness, the environment exceeds any other I have encountered. The concavity of the land eliminates distant horizons. The craft's enclosing wall vanishes into the sky's geometric pattern of light. When we had barely begun our explorations, a Klingon ship of unique design approached the alien craft. This required us to take our leave of the new beings and depart their spacecraft, their world ship. The Klingon ship, Kundar, is a new and unusual military craft. Its owner, Koronin, is a civilian. How she came into possession of Kundar remains unexplained. The Enterprise and the world ship and Koronin's Kundar are all within space disputed between the Federation and the Klingon Empire. Captain Kirk has no authority to order Koronin to leave. We must coexist. Meanwhile, the world ship beings have apparently decided to return our visit. They are approaching the Enterprise in a small sailboat driven by a power beam. A tiny spherical ship, like a pearl attached to a huge silken sail, grew larger on the view screen. The sailboat furled its sail and floated a hundred meters from the Enterprise. Sleek, naked, empty-handed, a tall scarlet beam began to form on the transporter platform. Spock realized the mistake he had made. Wait! The gravity! Spock leaped forward and caught the being as it materialized in the gravity field several times what it was used to. Change coordinates, Kirk shouted. The shuttlecraft deck, now! The beam swept Spock and the being to the 10th G environment of the shuttlecraft deck. As Spock reformed, the power of the being's mind crushed his defenses. Stunned, he collapsed. Three other beings formed. The music of their communication soared around him. The beings spread their arms wide, their long fingers unfolded. The frill at their sides extended, and they spread their wide wings. They took flight into the dangerously low sky. Athena's winged feathers cut the air as Lindy tried to soothe her. Spock's strength had vanished. The scarlet being faced him. It touched its forehead with one clawed finger. Very well, Spock whispered. He had known this must occur but he had expected time to prepare. Spock lifted his hand to the scarlet being's face. He touched its mind. Jim ran down the catwalk to the shuttlecraft deck, cursing himself for not thinking of the gravity difference. McCoy and Uhura followed. Spock lay on the soft new grass. Jim tumbled slowly in silent weightlessness. Commander Spock drew him within reach of a handhold. Mr. Spock, Jim believed he had failed. Captain, look. The world ship drifted placidly in the distance. Jim gave a shout of joy and relief. Mr. Spock remained impassive. The crash had completely blown communications. They could only wait till the Enterprise put a tractor beam on Copernicus and pulled them home. Jim looked through the porthole, trapped and drawn away by a second tractor beam. Koronin's battered ship receded toward the Klingon flagship. The enormous glowing world ship spun slowly in the background. It looks so peaceful, Jim said, yet it's the biggest most destructive weapon ever built. On the contrary, Captain, Commander Spock said, it is not a weapon at all. When they wish to explore a different portion of space, they change it to another safe configuration. Only under conditions of attack, a stress the flying people could not imagine, since they have never imagined war, does the world ship force the universe to move along unsafe vectors distorting the fabric of space. 
They even have you talking, as if they move the universe instead of the world ship. They do, Captain, in their frame of reference and in the terms of their physics. That makes no sense at all. It's ridiculous to say that one arbitrary point stays still and the flyers make the universe move. And yet, it moves. But that's impossible. You overlook one fact, Captain. What's that? The system works. The shuttlecraft crept toward the Enterprise. Jim followed Spock to the aft cabin to check on Stephen. Is he all right? Certainly, Captain. He wasn't injured by the ordeal. He endured no ordeal. Whatever he experienced, he sought out. When he wakes, he will no doubt continue in his pursuit of sensation. You speak very coldly of a man who saved your life. You asked me a question, I answered it. You appear to have come out of this unscathed. I am physically and intellectually undamaged. I was in control of my faculties when I set out upon this course of action. Therefore, on my return to the Enterprise, I will submit myself to security, preparatory to court-martial. Jim frowned. Court-martial? Certainly, Captain. You have no choice but to court-martial me. There are always choices, Spock. I disagree. Sometimes, circumstances demand a single course of action. I believe that if you consider the problem logically, you will come to the same conclusion. Though I confess that I do not understand how any conceivable logical progression of thought caused you to behave as you did. What peculiar behavior are you question, Commander? Your decision to come to the world ship. Your precipitous ride on Athena. I came to the world ship to get Lindy. When I saw you, what did you expect me to do? Jim scowled. Spock, didn't you realize you were compromising yourself and Starfleet and the whole Federation with your irrational acts? I perform no irrational acts. You don't call mind melding with a completely unknown alien species an irrational, impulsive act? I do not, Captain. It was obvious that we could never begin to communicate with the flying people until someone took drastic action. Once a decision is made, it is pointless to delay implementing it. You endangered yourself, and you endangered my ship. Maybe you're right. Maybe you'd better prepare yourself to accept the consequences of those actions. As I have already stated, I am prepared, but you too endangered yourself by what you did. You might judge that you also risked the ship. Captain, you have not explained why you prevented me from falling from the ledge. Maybe I'm just a thrill seeker, like Stephen. The tractor pulled the crippled shuttlecraft inside the Enterprise. Jim climbed out. Spock followed. Their shipmates waited anxiously. Jim! McCoy clasped Jim's hands, then abandoned restraint and gave him a bear hug. As soon as Jim extricated himself, he offered his hand to Mr. Scott. You kept the Enterprise out of combat, he said. It's possible you prevented a war. I'm very impressed with your actions. Thank you, Captain Carrick. Scott wrung Jim's hand. By the way, Mr. Scott, Jim said, just how far outside Federation territory is the Enterprise? Tis hard to say, Captain. It was still inside when Koundar came barreling out of the warship, and then uh, I uh, disobeyed your orders a wee bit in case it came to a rescue, as it did. Since then... Uh, dispatches have been buzzing about like nuts. Seems the Enterprise has been granted embassy status. Any place the ship is, is Federation territory. The director is very grateful to you. Spock raised one eyebrow. Fascinating. 
I should hope he would be grateful, McCoy said. And grateful to you, too, Mr. Spock, considering what's happened. If you hadn't known enough about the world ship, we'd be right in the middle of some pretty heavy fireworks. I believe my actions to be necessary, Spock said. And you were right, Jim said suddenly. Of course, Spock said. I mean it, Commander. I said some ill-considered things to you a little while ago, and I agree with you on the subject of a court-martial, but I was wrong, and so are you. I beg your pardon, Spock said, sounding as if it was possible, highly affronted. No, Commander Spock, listen to me. There will be no court-martial. If you hadn't had the guts to mind meld with Scarlet, would you claim bravery for yourself in stopping Koronin? Spock said. I think not. There is no bravery involved when there is no choice. Jim could think of no reply. I, for one, disagree, McCoy said. But I hope I can disagree in a civilized manner. Your manners appear quite civilized to me, Doctor. Why, thank you, Mr. Spock. Federation, Klingon, and worldship people gathered within the worldship. At the request of Admiral Noguchi, the Warp Speed Vaudeville Company consented to perform for an audience composed of all three groups. The spectators settled down on a natural stone terrace. The real performance began. Jim found himself enjoying it all over again. But as the applause of the Enterprise crew echoed hollowly in the amphitheater, Jim grew uncomfortably aware of the Klingon director's silence. Far from applauding Lindy's magic, he glared with intense irritation. Since the director did not react, neither did anyone else from his fleet. Nothing in the first half of the performance thawed him. The vaudevillians played as best they could to scattered Federation applause and the fluty whistles of the world ship beams, but the disapproval of the Klingons had a chilling effect. Aren't you enjoying the show? Jim asked the director at Innovision. Your civilization, if one may dignify it with that term, is in extreme decline. He turned his back and ignored Jim until intermission ended. Stephen's spectacular juggling failed to inspire any response from the director. The singer sang and the mime mimed in the presence of the director's intense, silent fury and the restless discomfort of the other Klingons, even the enthusiasm of the Enterprise crew began to fade. Mr. Coxper entered, stage left. Even if he's wonderful, Jim thought, still curious about Coxper's act, the director won't like it. Why couldn't he be absent again, like the other night? Then at least this would all be over with. Mr. Coxper struck a pose, waited for silence, and launched into his translation of Shakespeare's most famous soliloquy. Shall I kill myself or not? I can't decide if it's better to be miserable or to end it all. If I sleep, that is to say die, all my exquisitely painful sensitivity will end. That would be wonderful. But what if I dream? Now there's a real problem. Who wants to grow old? Who wants to listen to the ignorant bellyaching of illiterate critics when he can end it all by stabbing himself with a dagger in his bare bodkin? Who would bottle a bear and put up with all that grunting and sweating if he wasn't scared of going straight to hell? Jim sank down, appalled. The audience sat in exquisitely painful silence. Suddenly, the Klingon director leaped to his feet and shrieked. Jim started, believing for a moment that the director was leading an attack. Then he realized that the screams signified approval. Abandoning his dignity, the director twirled and howled. All his personnel followed his example. Mr. Coxler took the applause, the commotion, and a dozen curtain calls. As his duty. 
science officer's log, star date 0009.8. The reaction of the Klingon director and his minions to the vaudeville company was most fascinating. The director failed to realize that Amalinda Lucarian's performance was a triumph of stagecraft rather than witchcraft. He believed her magic to be a manifestation of evil. Fortunately, his aesthetic perception of Mr. Coxburgh as a genius overshadowed his misgivings. He has arranged a cultural tour of the Empire for the Neo-Shakespearean. The tour will culminate when the director presents Mr. Coxburgh to the Klingon Empress. A door to peace between the Federation and the Empire has been opened. James Kirk wielded the key. No one can say how long the truce may last, but it is a beginning. As the company packed its equipment, Spock went looking for his cousin. Stephen, Spock said, using the Vulcan's own chosen name. Stephen tossed Spock a club. Spock plucked it spinning from the air and passed it back. Stephen, I have acted harshly toward you in the past. Instead of replying, Stephen added items to the pattern. Six clubs, a knife, an unlit torch. Perhaps I will do so again in the future, Spock said, for truly I do not comprehend the choices you have made for your life, but I am grateful for the risk you took for me. I am in your debt. Stephen regarded him across the tumbling clubs, his gaze ice blue and steady. Vulcans don't collect debts, he said. Nevertheless, you may someday need more than your ingenuity can provide. I am not entirely without resources. Whatever your motives, I'm grateful for your action. You know my motives, Spock. I'm a thrill seeker. He flung the torch high. It burst into flames. As Spock passed the torch back, he realized that he had no idea how to stop juggling so many items. The mischief in Stephen's blue eyes hinted that he might find humor in Spock's difficulty. For once, Spock did not begrudge Stephen's laughter. Jim Kirk stood on a ledge overlooking the natural amphitheater. No trace remained of the performance that had occurred. Scarlet swooped down and landed nearby. I am glad to see you one last time. One last time, Scarlet. You mustn't leave. Everything's different now. The Enterprise can stay near the world ship. We have so much to learn. Scarlet blinked. You see, do you not? The pattern is already changing. A world ship will become a point of contention. Someday your people may be ready to meet us. Someday. Worldship people may be wise enough to meet you, but that is of the future. What do you mean, someday? Perhaps our children's children's children will greet each other. I have no children. Scarlet's wings unfurled. The silky webbing slipped around Jim's shoulder. You are but young. You're going to move the world ship, Jim said, not wanting to believe it. Oh, you misunderstand. Jim felt a brief flash of hope. I do not control the world ship, James. I control the universe. The world ship glowed, a distant jewel. The Enterprise and the Klingon director's fleet lay safely outside its vortex. From the bridge, Jim watched it and regretted its imminent disappearance. Lindy and Dr. McCoy waited with him, and even Mr. Spock paused in his work to gaze at the viewscreen. Scarlet's image shimmered into being. I wanted to say 
goodbye. You will not be forgotten. Nor will you, Jim said. Goodbye. Lindy Magician, may you fly with lightning. Thank you, Scarlet. Who, who, a singing one. I remember what you sang to me all my life, Uhura said. May the wind buoy you and sing you to sleep. Scarlet gazed at Spock and sang his name. Spock, you are the fixed point. On the stories that we will tell, the stories could not move without you. This part of the universe will never again pass the world ship, Spock said. I know that, but I am glad we met, and I am glad you will not forget us, nor will my people forget you. Go. Bye, Spock. Scarlet's image faded. The world ship vanished, leaving nothing but spinning, cast-off wall spheres. Captain, Uhura exclaimed, a disturbance in the fleet. A tiny courier ship burst free and headed straight toward the Enterprise. The battle cruisers opened fire. Shields up! Jim shouted. Uhura, hailing frequencies. Director, what's the meaning of this? The director appeared. His brow ridges pulsed with anger. A traitor Coronin has escaped. Forgive me, Captain. I must. His image faded. The little ship dived between the dangerous wall spheres, blasting one with its anaphaser and setting off an enormous burst of energy. With a spectral flash, Coronin's stolen courier vanished into warp space. The ship of the fleet twisted through warp transition, producing a wild clash of interacting spectra. The Enterprise floated alone in silent space. Wow, Lindy exclaimed. That was an escape worthy of Houdini. I suppose the director will just catch her again, Jim said. He felt a sneaky tendril of admiration for the renegade who had outsmarted the director and all the resources of the Klingon Empire. I think her immediate recapture is unlikely, Spock said. The fleet could not follow her directly. By the time they discover her trail, she will have made her escape. McCoy looked quizzically at the science officer. Mr. Spock, you sound happy she got away. I have no feelings in the matter at all. I suppose you wouldn't have any feelings if she'd caught you and sold you as a spy. Certainly not, though I would hope I might be as adept at escape as Corridan. You would be, Lindy said. You've got the makings of a great illusionist. Lindy's right, Mr. Spock, Jim said. On stage, you do a very effective disappearing act. Thank you, Captain. Hey, what about me? I'm in the act, too. Spock only has to vanish. I have to appear. Jim, who had indeed forgotten that McCoy was in the magic box illusion, maintained a discreet silence. It's just that Mr. Spock has so much natural presence, Lindy said, but she let her voice trail off when she saw McCoy's wounded expression. I believe that what Ms. Lucarian is trying to tell you, Dr. McCoy, Spock said with his usual bluntness, is that you are a doctor not a magician.